we all have certain things we need. You know, those are things like the food we have to eat uh, and so on. And keep in mind, you know, he's writing in the 19th century, early in the Industrial Revolution. You know, there are a lot of poor people who are subsisting on mostly just lower pleasures. But Mill imagines a world in which people would be able to have access to more than just those things he thinks of as the lower pleasures. Uh, and those things might be the ability to own a book uh, and read it and enjoy it and have the leisure time you know, to enjoy it and think about it and, and so on. Stuff that you know many of us now uh, sort of take for granted. You're listening to Essential Scholars a new podcast series where we take a closer look at some of the most influential thinkers throughout history who have helped shape our ideas of liberty, individual rights, economics, and entrepreneurship. Each episode, I'll be joined by a different guest to explore these essential scholars in depth, including their most important insights and why these ideas are still relevant in today's world. I'm your host, Rosemary Fike. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Essential Scholars podcast. I'm Rosemary Fike, and today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite classical liberal scholars, John Stuart Mill. Joining me in this conversation is Dr. Sandra Peart. Dr. Peart is the Dean as well as the E. Claiborne Robbins Distinguished Professor in Leadership Studies at the University of Richmond. She's the author of many books including the essential John Stuart Mill, as well as one of my favorites, Towards an Economics of Natural Equals, a documentary history of the early Virginia School of Political Economy. Highly recommend. Thank you so much for joining me today, Sandy. Oh, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to this. So as I said, John Stuart Mill is one of my favorites. Uh, he's had a big influence on my work on women's rights um, from a individual rights perspective. Um, but let, can we talk a little bit about who he was? I don't know much about his life, his upbringing. I know his dad was a pretty big name in economics, but Absolutely. I'd love to know more. Yes. Yeah, so uh, John Stuart Mill had a very unusual, even for his time, upbringing. Uh, his father, James Mill, is a famous political economist uh, at the time, uh, 19th century uh, England. And uh, James Mill decided that he was going to bring up little John Stewart uh, in this odd way where he would, along with Jeremy Bentham, uh, teach Mill, um, give him this extraordinary education where Mill ended up reading Latin and Greek at a very young age um, and uh, learning about David Ricardo's principles of political economy. Um, he would read a chapter of in draft of Ricardo's uh, principles and then walk around the garden with his father, uh, telling his father uh, what Ricardo was arguing uh, in the principles. And if anyone in the audience has read David Ricardo's principles, you'll realize that was a very difficult task. <laughs> um, so, so this very stringent, stringent education uh, early in his life uh, and very analytically focused. And then um, he has something of a breakdown uh, still at an early age um, and comes to realize that there's another side of education, a softer side, if you want to think of it that way, poetry and the arts and so on. He reads a great deal of poetry um, and um, uh, sort of changes his somewhat, at least his outlook uh, on life. So a strange kind of upbringing. His mother was not a very um, uh, warm person, he tells us in his autobiography, um, and really the father figure, um, and knowing everyone who is important in political economy is um, an important sort of background fact for us to think about when it comes to John Stuart Mill. So a lot of his influences, they were pretty associated with utilitarianism. So how, what kind of role did utilitarianism play in how John Stuart Mill sees the world? Yeah, so he writes a book on utilitarianism and publishes it as a defense of utilitarianism. It's a little different from the way we think of utilitarianism today. So uh, most of us 
um, have a you know sort of sense that utilitarianism means the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, that's actually a, a very packed phrase. It's difficult to actually figure out what that you know what that means. Uh, and for John Stuart Mill, so Jeremy Bentham is you know known as the uh, you know one of the most important utilitarians, um, and so. He absolutely is influenced by Bentham uh, and writes on Bentham, uh, and again by his father, who's also a uh, utilitarian. Um, uh, but he really struggles with the notion of what it means to say the greatest good, and also what it means to say for the greatest number. Um, so those two parts of the phrase have to be unpacked. So what does greatest good mean? He talks, he links it as Bentham did to pleasure. Um, and Bentham talks about how you can measure pleasure um, and, you know, really hopes, and this is a hope that, that continues through, uh, through the whole 19th century, um, various people think that it will be possible to, to quantify pleasure. Uh, and by the end of the century, um, there are all sorts of what today sound like sort of crazy proposals to, um, you know, create a hedometer, which would, you know, physically measure pleasure by registering um, how the brain reacts. Of course, today with neuroscience, you know, we might think that's not so crazy, but it, it, it does sound a little difficult. Um, uh, so what is pleasure? Then Mill uh, struggles with that, you know, trying to figure out, um, uh, uh, are all pleasures the same? How do we uh, compare them? And he talks about qualitative differences in pleasures, as and that kind of ties into his thinking about poetry and reading poetry and so on, um, as well as quantitative differences in pleasure. He talks about like higher and lower pleasures, yeah, right? What, what's that distinction? Yeah. So it's a distinction that ha uh, has befuddled a lot of people, um, you know, since Mill wrote about it, and and some people uh, have objected to the idea, but he's trying to get at the idea that, um, that you know, there we all have certain things we need um, and we in order to subsist, you know, and, and those um, give us what you could call pleasure or some people would refer to it as utility. Um, uh, you know, those are things like the food we have to eat uh, and so on. And keep in mind, you know, he's writing in the 19th century, early in the Industrial Revolution, um, and you know, there are a lot of poor people who are subsisting on um, mostly just lower pleasures. In other words, they're mostly just able to food th feed themselves, clothe themselves, have a home of some sort, uh, and there's not a lot of other things that they can bring into their lives uh, that would give them additional pleasure. But Mill imagines a world in which people would be able to have access to more than just those things he thinks of as the lower pleasures. Uh, and, and those things might be, again, I go back to the poetry, you know, might be uh, the ability to own a book uh, and read it and enjoy it and have the leisure time, you know, to enjoy it and think about it and, and so on, stuff that, you know, many of us now uh, sort of take for granted for in the early 19th century, uh, some of those things were really out of the reach of many of the people who worked uh, at laborers, as they were called, worked for a living, and and uh, the lower classes. And and yet Mill, uh, as I say, he thinks everyone aspires to have more, uh, and he calls those things that are not just tied to your subs your physical subsistence higher pleasures. Uh, so. You know, I think it kind of got him into trouble. Um, some people think, well, it sounds kind of elitist, right? To think, oh, this is a higher pleasure as opposed to, you know, this other thing, which is just a lower pleasure. But if you think of it in terms of, well, you know, what are the things we need to exist? Uh, but then what can give us a more fulfilled life? What will make us thrive as opposed mm -hmm. to simply survive? So kind of the difference between subsistence and, and actual flourishing yes. and enjoyment of life but exactly. beyond survival. Exactly, yes. So this idea that people want to improve themselves, um, you know, reform and improvement and remaking, that's a central theme in, yeah. in Mill's work. Yes. Can we talk a little bit about that and maybe how it's connected to this idea of liberty? 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great, really, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, and, and it does tie to his upbringing a little bit. Um, not to say everything he wrote about is, you know, sort of personally driven. In fact, it's I, I would object to that characterization. But he does talk about how he was a manufactured man. He uses that word in his autobiography. And and the sense, and, and you know, he sort of struggles against the way his father manufactured him. And then he remakes himself, right? When he has his breakdown and then he emerges from it and thinks about how, you know, what is human flourishing and how he will flourish. Um, and, and so I think there's this, this personal um, side to it, but then uh, he, he has a view of human nature and this goes back to at least to Adam Smith um, as being, um, uh, personally driven to improve themselves. So people naturally want to make themselves have better lives and better lives for their families and people who come after them and so on. Uh, and Mill's view is that um, in order to be able to, to have the best possible life, in order to flourish, um, people need to have a wide array of choice uh, so that they learn what are what are the pleasures that give them you know what are the goods that give them the most pleasure and so on what paths in life should they should they uh, uh, seek out and obtain uh, and so uh, there needs to be um, a, a, you know I, I talk about it like an, an array of choice but of course it's you need to have the liberty to make those choices uh, in order to truly flourish and what what kinds of liberty or what kinds of freedom is Mill saying these yeah. are, are really essentially important? Yeah, so that's a great question. So he really does focus on, um, you know, he's an economist, um, uh, among other things. But he focuses a lot on consumption. Um, so, you know, you need to, and again, it goes to these higher and lower choices. You know, you need to be able to have the, the ability um, to choose freely among different goods that and that's a sort of um, you know kind of like a baseline consideration it's not it's not the most perhaps the most um, alluring kind of freedom but you know you need to be able to make those choices and to compare goods to compare your consumption to compare how you feel in this case in that case and so on um, so that's sort of you know uh, um, as I say a necessary condition but there are all sorts of perhaps much more fundamental things um, like being able to choose your spouse, um, being able to choose whether to stay with your spouse, being able to choose how to have children or when to have children and how many children to have. You know, those are those are choices that uh, in the 19th century weren't open to basically half the population. In other words, weren't open to women in the same way that they were open to men. Uh, and Mill sees that and thinks it's a it's you know that is some a place where you mentioned the word reform where reform is needed. So what happens? So in the case of women, or in Mill's time, in the case of people who were enslaved, what is it about that lack of freedom that he thinks is so detrimental to to those groups, and not just them, but to all of society? Yeah. So great, great point. So um, I'll start with fl slavery. Uh, in the first place, um, uh, slavery is obviously, um, you know, horrifically detrimental to the enslaved person. Um, and Mill, um, you know, is adamant that, um, uh, to, of course, slavery has been abolished in the British Empire before he's really doing a lot of writing. Uh, but, you know, there is some talk of, um, uh, by uh, Thomas Carlyle and, and others uh, of how it was a failure. You know, the the ab abolition um, actually left enslaved people um, in in worse conditions, or at least uh, definitely harmed the plantation owners and the enslavers. Um, Mill is adamant that um, you know one must have the ability that one must have the freedom to own oneself. Um, you know, so that's a hard stop right there. Um, uh, uh, but on the other, uh, it, he also argues that um, uh, it, uh, the, ins the act of enslaving um, is morally corrupting to the, to the slave owner. Um, and so 
uh, at just as the act of not letting women be free to leave marriage, a marriage, uh, is morally corrupting to the to men. Um, and so, so there there are harms on both sides uh, that he sees. Um, and you know, the primary harm is to the people who are in these conditions. Um, but he does he does think it's it's harmful to society writ large because both these the enslavers or men who are in marriages uh, in which they can take advantage of women um, are, as I say, morally corrupted, morally harmed, society is harmed uh, by that lack of freedom. Is there maybe utilitarian or kind of material consequences of limiting choices of these groups of people as well? Yeah, so absolutely. Although I'm not sure that those for Mill are the, are the most important considerations, but uh, absolutely. Uh, if women, for instance, are uh, brought up to only be mothers, uh, not that there's anything, I'm a mother, you know, not that that's, uh, maybe I shouldn't say, you know, only in a pejorative sense, but, you know, that's the only role they're allowed, um, then it is, the, it is true that they can't you know, they don't flourish, they can't enter the labor force. Uh, and so there's a productive element that is lost. Um, and um, as I say, as you say, a material harm. Um, it is also true, although I'm trying to think, I don't think Mill writes a lot about this, but um, uh, it was, as a good Smithian, uh, it was argued and Mill followed in this argument that slavery was material le materially less productive than uh, free labor. Uh, and, and he, when Mill writes about the Jamaicans who had recently been freed, um, and um, he, he joins a debate with Carlisle. Carlisle says, well, look, these, these people um, who have recently been made free are not being productive. They're not entering the labor market. They're sitting around. They're just, you know, as he puts it, eating pumpkins. Mill says, well, you know, if they're not in the labor market, it's because wages are too low. Uh, and when wages are higher, they will enter into the labor market and work isn't good in and of itself. So, you know, let them be free and make their decisions. And they will, he writes, eventually uh, acquire the habits of free persons, that is the consumption habits of free persons. You know, they've been kept as enslaved persons for so long. They're not, they're, they don't realize that there are these higher pleasures that they could achieve if they entered the labor market. Uh, so you know, the problem he writes will work itself out through the labor market um, if wages rise. So when, when individuals have the freedom to choose, they learn about, you know, what it means to, to flourish in a better way. They learn how to make better choices. Absolutely. And that's not just good for their development as humans. It is good for, for everyone as well. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly. So another type of, of kind of freedom that Mill talked a lot about is this freedom of expression and free competition of ideas. Uh, why, why was free speech so important in Mill's view? Yeah, so it's, it's all part of this uh, idea that the laboring classes who are you know, a large share of the population and who are uh, coming into their own right in the mid 19th century and second half of the 19th century and Mill's kind of looking forward to a time in which the franchise will be expanded. So he's he writes about expanding it and speaks in Parliament about expanding it to women, for instance, but also uh, to uh, a larger share of the laboring classes. And if they're going to vote and just determine who will rule uh, and how people will rule, um, themselves, you know, and others uh, who will enter into British Parliament, they need to be able to distinguish among arguments. So he thinks they will be bombarded with arguments by politicians, promises, uh, you know, I'll do this if you elect me, vote for me, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and he wants them to be able to think critically and analytically 
about the propositions that are being put forward. Um, so is it a good idea, for instance, um, to have an expanded factory act, um, which limits working hours and so on? That's an argument that a worker needs to be able to you know, think through and then cast his vote um, for or, or against. So speech, uh, in Mill's view, is the way that we convey political and also economic, but you know all sorts of ideas uh, to each other. Uh, and we need to both be able to listen and to answer um, uh, and to make choices based on what, what people have, have, as I say, argued. So it, it has, an for, in his time, uh, the, the idea of uh, free expression and so on uh, uh, has a learning element, you know, so it helps people learn, um, but it also has a social element. It's the way in which we come to rule ourselves and make joint decisions about, you know, how we're going to proceed going forward. So he thinks it's tremendously important. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's not the case that it should be entirely free. In other words, without restrictions, there should be norms about how we speak to each other, um, norms of politeness and so on. Um, and he writes about how, you know, it's, it's, if you disagree, so there are corn dealers in his day, the corn is a, basically a word for all kinds of crops that are important uh, and brought to the marketplace and so on. And if you think the corn dealers are uh, price gouging, you know, you might be uh, led to speak against them. Uh, and in his view, it's okay to, to say, you know, these, are, these guys are price gouging, um, but it's not, he writes, okay to uh, incite violence against them. Uh, so that's a, a, an important line that he draws. That does seem to be an important distinction. Um, in terms of conversations today about <clears throat> freedom of expression, uh, they, there's often comments that, you know, hate speech, that has harm, but that's not what Mill is talking about. Well, he's he's really talking about, so he does have this idea, which is tremendously important, the no harm principle. Um, and, you know, he says there needs to be liberty in, in all areas in which uh, we're not causing harm uh, toward other people. And then when we are potentially causing harm, uh, there's uh, there's not a presumption that immediately, you know, one it, one is not allowed to do something that would cause a harm. But um, uh, uh, he writes about how these harms have to be, in order to be prohibited, they have to be something we could logically anticipate. So, you know, you, you call for a riot <clears throat> against corn dealers outside of the corn dealers' workplace, you know, you could anticipate violence. Um, uh, but so logically anticipate and or reasonably anticipate, uh, and then the harms, you know, they're they're not. Um, they need to be something widespread, and I guess the word I would use is noticeable. So if you think of, for instance, microaggressions or something very small, um, those are those are can be widespread, and so perhaps you would want to have a prohibition because of the widespread nature of them. So you might agree, for instance, that there are certain words we won't use. Um, and, you know, we do that uh, today. And I think you would think those are those are good um, social norms for us to have. Uh, but if I, you and I were to have a situation in which what I say would cause you just a very slight harm, and you're the only one who might feel that. so. For instance, I'm Canadian, so perhaps someone says something about me being a Canuck. Well, you know, that doesn't particularly harm me, but perhaps it might, you know. And and, and that in the, that kind of situation, um, then Mill might feel like, you know, there could be some sort of agreement, uh, not necessarily legislation, but an agreement. But not in the sense that we want to exclude people who disagree with us oh, from yes. sharing their ideas. Yes, absolutely not. So disagreement, he thinks, is fundamentally important uh, to work through, and it's productive. Um, so to go back to your you know, materially productive point from earlier, um, disagreements are productive in the intellectual space. You know, that's, so he writes that you know, even if 
we have settled the science on a particular um, argument. Um, disagreement about it might help us understand that argument even better. Um, so working through a disagreement um, makes us a better scientist or a better uh, politician or, or uh, whatever the group is we're thinking about. Uh, and, and when ideas become settled and accepted, they become stale. Um, and so he's very, he, you, you're absolutely right. He thinks that disagreement and as I say, working through those or talking about those, uh, is re, uh, those are really important things to do. So I want to change gears a little bit and talk about Mill's feminism and, and what inspired him to be one of the earliest people to take on, on this cause so publicly and so vocally. Uh, again, not that everything comes from one's personal life, but he did have a very interesting personal situation that I think uh, is important to mention in this context. So at a young age, um, Soon after his breakdown, he meets um, a woman called Harriet Taylor. Uh, Harriet Taylor uh, is plugged into the intellectual community um, as is Mill uh, of her day. Uh, and they meet at a dinner party and very, very quickly uh, come to have at least a very intense intellectual connection. She too is a feminist um, and Mill uh, early in his life uh, writes an essay to her about marriage. Um, and it's an essay that essentially argues what he'll later argue in along with her in the subjection of women and um, that women should be raised as men are raised, um, that they should be educated as men are educated, that they should be allowed the same choices that men are allowed. Um, and so we know that he came to this feminist position very early in his lifetime. I don't know that I have a definitive answer for why he came to that position, but it was a deeply held uh, conviction. Uh, and uh, in terms of then his personal life, he and Harriet um, uh, agreed to have a very unusual for his time arrangement. She leaves her husband they travel together, they go to Europe together. Um, there's some question about whether it's a platonic or just an intellectual uh, relationship or something more than that, but they are certainly together uh, and they are noticed to be together. Uh, Very and it, scandalous in his day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It causes a huge scandal. Um, Mill loses most of his friendships. Um, so the friendship with um, uh, Thomas Carlyle, although that had deteriorated over the slavery position as well. Um, uh, but with many intellectuals of his time, he they become quite secluded. Um, and Mill loses his uh, the support of his family. Um, so you know his his relationship with his mother, which had never been great, um, you know deteriorates with this. He loses all contact with a sister and a brother. And um, so it's a kind of a devastating cost to pay for his belief you know, that it, uh, this was a choice that these two people could freely enter into. Um, and so I think that personal uh, situation is, is in, always in the backdrop of what he writes about choice, of what he writes about public opinion, of what he writes about disagreement and so on. Um, uh, he, he lived what he wrote about. Uh, and it's rare to see someone uh, so convinced of those things that they, um, as I say, they'll bear that deep personal cost for their beliefs. One of the well, things I think is really interesting about the way Mill spoke about women's rights and even it, it relates to his arguments about abolishing slavery as well, is that you know, anything about women's character that is attributed to women being, you know, naturally intellectually inferior or weaker, he's saying it's really a function of the institutions and, and the restrictions of choice, um, which to me, it's a very powerful argument. Right. And that argument about, you know, nature versus circumstances is an important one throughout the, the 19th century. Um, but you're absolutely right that he thinks that women are uh, naturally as uh, 
as capable as men of making political and economic choices. Doesn't mean they're exactly the same, obviously, um, but but in those capacities, they uh, they the reason they are uh, less capable is that they are not educated to make choices in the way that that um, uh, men are educated. And he writes that you know the marriage choice, you know, for someone who is raised without the ability to make choices of any sort. Um, then to be forced to make this choice, which is, you know, a, a choice for life, supposedly, uh, and uh, on which one has very limited uh, information, uh, he says, well, no wonder people get it wrong often, <laughs> because, you know, they just haven't had much practice at anything, let alone at, at you know, dating and so on, and, and um, uh, spending time with people of the other sex. Uh, and so, so, for him, it's not a surprise that that uh, marriages often uh, go wrong. And and the point I didn't mention about Harriet Taylor um, is she was a married woman, you know, when he first met um, uh, Harriet, uh, and and so uh, with children, uh, and so to leave this family um, and spend time with Mill, as you say, was very scandalous. Um, but it was a marriage that clearly wasn't uh, one in which she she. Um, you know, she was deeply unhappy. It's, yeah, this idea that in order to, you know, develop our capabilities, uh, we need to be able to make mistakes and learn from them, right? right. That's uh, essential, you know, being free is difficult, but that we are going to make mistakes, but that process of making mistakes, maybe even early on is, is right. really important for us. Yeah. And it's also for him, he's also talking about living with the consequences of your choice. You know, so yes, you make a mistake or yes, you make a commitment, then you have to actually follow through on it. Uh, and and but, you know, is it the case that you need to follow through on a lifetime commitment? You know, in that case, he thinks there is, you know, there should be an exception. So let's turn to Mill's discussion of, you know, property and how, um, you know, what are the importance of property rights? How does that relate to, um, you know, different systems of organizing the economy? How does that influence production and distribution patterns? Sure. So Mill writes very famously uh, in his Principles of Political Economy that um, we we uh, cannot control how production occurs once you put it in place. You know, if you, you plant a seed, then, you know, you can water it and so on. But there, there are certain things, physical things, that we're not able as humans to control very all that carefully. Uh, um, however, he says, we can control the distribution of goods and services. Now, he doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. Um, so, you know, if we decide we suddenly want to have an, you know, a huge land reform and reallocate the land in Ireland, which is you know, something he's quite interested in. Um, there will be consequences of doing that, um, but you know, we do have these these much more um, uh, agency over institutions, as you uh, to use the word that you just used. Um, so property, property is something over which we have some agency. Um, it's been distributed. You know, we we all own something in addition to ourselves. Um, uh, and the question is, you know, is that the distribution that we finally want to live with? Uh, and he writes, in other words, is it sort of sacrosanct? He writes, well, it's not really sac. It, certainly, property and land for him is not really sac sacrosanct. Um, it has been distributed, um, but it's sort of in a random way or a way that reflects, um, not quite random actually, but a way that reflects, uh, you know, who had authority uh, and was of a certain lineage and so on in the 19th century. Um, that said, you know, the, the property uh, uh, associated with what we earn, he thinks we need to have the freedom to, uh, you know, earn uh, and keep. Uh, at least the mo for the most part, um, he does write about taxation, but uh, earn and keep uh, the fruits of our labor. Um, and then he talks 
a lot as people did in the 19th century about different institutional arrangements that might uh, change how we produce and consume. Uh, so socialist experiments uh, and communist experiments in the 19th century. Um, and there's a lot of back and forth um, in the 20th century about, you know, was Mill really a socialist and, and so on, because he has a, uh, devotes a lot of attention to this in the, in, uh, the principles. Uh, I think he, he comes down on uh, favoring capitalism, favoring property rights, um, with some limitations that I'll come back to. He, he does think that there are some socialistic schemes which allow for private property that might work, um, but he doesn't think that those should be imposed on anyone. He, he believes that you know, if they work and they spread, then you know, that'll just show that they work um, and, and um, uh, no government you know, should actually make us all become socialists or whatever. Um, so, so he, um, uh, but I said there's one um, sort of little asterisk relative to property um, and that the property in terms of the fruits of our labor, that has to do with inheritance. Um, so he does allow that um, while we have the, the right to the fruits of our labor, we don't have the rights to someone else's labor, fruits of their labor, and in particular to, as a child, you don't have the right to your parents, to all of your parents' wealth. Um, mm -hmm. And so he says, you know, uh, given the government needs to have taxation and earn, uh, uh, earn a certain amount of income, um, or earn, <laughs> uh, get it, collect a certain <laughs> Uh, uh, he allows that there could be um, taxes on inher very large inheritances. And that would be something that is legitimate and yes, doesn't in his view. distort as many incentives? Yes, in his view. So, and, and it would be something, you know, that would, uh, the way he writes, what he writes is that, well, children have the expectation that they'll have the lifestyle of their parents so you would allow for um, a parent to give a bequest to, to the children that would allow them to have that, that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but then any wealth that's accumulated above that might legitimately be taxed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Mill's discussion of, you know, a capitalist system, um, he, he said, in the book, you say he favors a system of capitalism that's constantly evolving, that's that's ever evolving. What does he mean by that? And does he make any predictions about how that market will will shape itself over time? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So he what he observes at the time is that, and keep in mind, this is mid 19th century England, um, industrializing England, um, he observes what he calls a sort of trampling and crushing kind of competition. Uh, he uses those words in which people are, are engaged in, um, you know, just really long work hours and trying to just sort of subsist and not as we, to use the word we used earlier, thriving. Um, and so, he would like to see a world in which, and he, he thinks there will be a world in which um, the, the laboring classes will become more the authors of their own lifestyles. That is, they will, um, with economic growth, uh, they will have more leisure time, some leisure time. He doesn't, um, you know, make a prediction as John Maynard Keynes did, you know, in which, you know, people would have huge amounts of leisure time in the future, but he, but Mill would like to see the workday, I think he would like to see the workday shortened. Um, and again, keep in mind that the, they are working very long work, day, work days at, uh, in mid 19th century England. Um, uh, and they'll come to enjoy those higher pleasures, again, with economic growth, um, which will allow them to, um, you know, not simply subsist, uh, but to enjoy uh, goods that are not, uh, you know, physically necessary to their life, uh, to, to living. Um, so, you know, how we'll get there, 
uh, Mill would say this will happen through economic growth, and he does. He's you know writing in a period of high growth and and uh, foresees that there will be innovation um, that happens as a result of again kind of economic liberty um, and people wanting to better themselves. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he he doesn't write a lot about. Um, how innovation will occur, but it is through that marketplace of ideas. Uh, and then I'll, I would add, he has this interesting chapter on stationarity, uh, the, what he thinks of as the stationary state. And, and uh, that would be a, 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 a situation in which there is not growth, economic growth. Mm -hmm. That is, output has, um, has stopped growing and we're in a sort of steady state. Um, mm -hmm. And he says, well, you know, that there might be a steady state, but it's not one in which things stop changing. There will be change. It'll just be a different kind of change. So it won't be that we'll grow more wheat, but instead we'll, we might have better ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, or maybe we'll get more leisure um, So, or we'll have better arts. Uh, and so he has this notion of, you know, separating physicality from the non-material things that we all consume. Uh, and those will continue to flourish and evolve, even if physicality stays the same. So I want to end with one last question, and hopefully it's something that in our second conversation we pick back up on. But what's the role for the state in all of this? Yeah, so we will have to come back to that it's one. A big but, question. <laughs> um, so it's it's a tremendous question. Um, what you know, Mill is a reformer, so he's all about how we reform ourselves and how society, so individuals reform themselves, but also how society reforms itself. And he's writing in a time when he would like the state to unwind some of the policies they have in place that are um, hampering economic and social progress. So, so um, he would like, for instance, then the state to, to put women on an equal footing with men. He would like the state to get out of the business of enslavement and keep out of that business. Um, uh, and so he's, He's really trying to, and, and he would like to see the franchise extended. So you know, he would like the state, that is parliament, to enact laws that would allow more people to vote. Um, he would like um, uh, to see reform in Ireland. Um, and we haven't talked a lot about Ireland and perhaps can come to, back to this um, in, in the next segment. But, you know, he thinks that to use your distinction between institutions versus people, Ireland is an economic, having economic difficulties as a result of institutions rather than natural differences, the Irish people themselves. Um, and he would like the, the, the state uh, to reform those institutions in Ireland so that it would have a future that is in which people can thrive. Um, so that's that's the one of the major thrusts that he has in terms of his writing about the state. Um, there are, of course, lots of other things that he thinks the state should do. Um, and those, uh, I guess I would just highlight, and perhaps we can close on this, um, he, he thinks the state has a major role in terms of education. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, you can tie that to many of the themes we've already touched on, um, you know, in terms of making sure that people actually have the ability to thrive, they need to be educated. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today and talking to us about the wonderful ideas of John Stuart Mill. I am very much looking forward to part two of our conversation. Great. Thank you for the invitation and I look forward to the next segment as well. You've been listening to Essential Scholars, a new podcast series that explores the ideas and insights of some of history's most influential thinkers. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and head over to essentialscholars.org to learn more. See you next time.